speaking to you about Orion. Um, as you all know, I hope, we've had a very successful milestone uh, in December with our flight into low Earth orbit. Um, let me uh, reiterate a few of the things that, that Peter had said. It's uh, a very unique situation now in the United States and the world to be able to uh, uh, embark in human space. The space station is up and operating. It has been man-tended for 15 years. And as Peter said, with six. So it's a tremendous laboratory for learning how to live and operate in space. We have a tremendous infrastructure around Mars especially, but really all of the planets in the solar system. You know, New Horizons starting to send pictures back from Pluto, even though it's not a planet anymore. Um, marvelous mission and, and a lot of interest in, uh, in the community and especially in the youth. It's really amazing how excited children are about space. Um, it, you know, the term about being a rocket scientist, everybody's a rocket scientist if they're smart. It's really fun to, to uh, outreach and energize people in, in the program, and it's really international. And uh, NASA is uh, attempting to lead the world in, in this collaboration with all these other countries so we can accomplish a lot. Uh, the interesting aspect of low Earth orbit, space station supplies an opportunity to develop a low cost way to get into space and back. Interesting kind of note that uh, in the 50 years, half a century, we've been flying into space, around 600 people have gone into space, which you could say is either a lot or a few, from whatever your point of view is, but only 24 have gone above what we call low Earth orbit. And low Earth orbit in this area of the space station is two, 300 miles, statute miles. It's, if you look at a globe, it's less than any, it's about a centimeter above that globe. And, and the line I really, I really like was a, a former president of American Rocket Company that said, if Columbus had set about exploring the new world the way we're exploring the solar system, he would have built a raft, anchored it 200 meters off the coast, and declared he was discovering the new world. So we're learning a lot from Space Station. It's a tremendous uh, opportunity to get experience and knowledge and confidence in the machines. But what's unique about the opportunity now with the architecture that NASA and the world are pursuing is to be able to build a crewed vehicle and follow the scientific missions that are at, as I mentioned, Mars and, and beyond. So the two programs are very complementary. They use a lot of similar systems, parachutes, land systems, uh, guidance navigation, crew training and such. But uh, the, crew, the commercial crew and cargo vehicles, as Peter mentioned, can focus on short duration close to Earth. And you can afford to do things in that environment that you can't when you are weeks, months, or years away. So the reliability, the fault tolerance, the robustness of the system, so that you don't have to carry along a lot of backup systems to uh, protect the crew. And as you probably know, our primary goal, purpose, is to bring the crew back safely. There are missions and architectures to fly crews, one-way missions to Mars, which are very interesting, and people have various viewpoints about that. But if you think about it sort of in, in, uh, in the United States, when people came to America leaving, the, leaving Europe, they didn't ever intend to go back to Europe. So it's maybe not that far-fetched an idea. So it's very exciting right now because the community, our political environment in the United States, and really around the world, they are galvanizing and forming around this capability to explore and inspire the, the, pop, the people in all of these countries to go do this. So that's why we're so excited about the success of what Orion's done in, in this first step. So let me go through a couple slides and hopefully I've done the same thing Peter's done and not too many words so we can sort of go wherever, whatever direction you want to go when we answer questions at the end. Can I have the first slide, please? All right, one few slides. So maybe the next? Do I need to? So, I'll get started that uh, you probably all, I hope, are very familiar with the configuration of Orion. It has uh, a launch abort system, as Peter mentioned about the one pushing uh, the CST-100. We have a, a tractor uh, propulsion system. I'll go into that in a, in a second as to why. 
Uh, the heart of the vehicle is the crew module, designed to be as small as possible, to be as light as possible, so that the rocket propulsion systems that drive us great distances from the Earth, above the space station, out to the moon, or neutral gravity points, or asteroids, and then eventually the moons of Mars and then Mars, we want to be as small and light as possible so that reasonable rockets can get us out to those destinations and back. To again reduce the weight, there's a separable service module, which carries the consumables, power, and in-space propulsion. And the objective behind that is to lighten the weight of the landing systems on the crew module so they can be roughly half the weight of what uh, if we recovered everything. And again, Peter mentioned some of the reusability at the expense of being able to reuse the service module. But in that trade, it allowed us to uh, upgrade those components that are solar cell technologies and batteries and such, that as the program, being designed for 30 years or so, can be enhanced and improved and continually reducing cost, um, more affordability and mission flexibility. So with a, with a distraction to be able to make it lightweight, we also had an advantage to be able to upgrade the vehicle as, it, as we move forward in the years. The fairings at the back end are very interesting in that, uh, as you all are well aware, the launch loads are very high in the launch system. It takes a lot of energy to break the bonds of gravity. So again, to lighten up the structure, the fairings are separable after the first stage burn is completed. So we can save that mass of the structure. We don't have to carry it in the service module or in the crew module. And you can probably see in pictures later that the crew module is very robust uh, because it has to carry launch loads, entry landing loads. But the service module doesn't since those loads go through the fairings. So in the design of the spacecraft, we could optimize the total vehicle weight. Interestingly, over the last um, eight years or so of development of the program, the engineers have done a thousand trade studies to architect how the elements should be designed. One of those is the launch abort system. We only need it while we're in the atmosphere. Once we're at a high enough altitude or velocity, the normal entry systems can be used to recover the crew. So it's a short duration purpose and designed so that either on the, pa on the pad or any time up until that point, Virtually instantaneously, the vehicle could be removed, the crew cabin, away from the launch vehicle. So that, that rocket motor is a half a million pound thrust, burns for less than five seconds, and accelerates the 10-ton crew cabin to almost 500 miles an hour in that amount of time to save the crew. Now the plan is never to use it. It's only a, the launch vehicles have gotten, as Peter mentioned also, very robust. So, you know, hopefully someday in the future we could delete the launch abort system, but until we have that confidence to save the crew. So very interesting system the way it's been designed. Then, what I, on the next slide, I'd like to talk to you about our test architecture. So, um, Peter mentioned space launch system. On the way to space launch system, we took the funding that we had during the year to maximize the knowledge and confidence in as many of the systems as we could with a, a launch system that would be available earlier. So we um, uh, contracted with the Air Force basically for uh, United Launch Alliance for an Air Force launch service to be able to fly earlier and get confidence in our systems. Um, the program started out with seven or nine different launches, which you can imagine were very expensive for test flights. So in affordability, we had been combining objectives in each of the flights. And so all of that, with working with NASA to maximize what we needed to learn, we could focus on what we could accomplish with each test. And I'll show you a little later about what all we've done with, the, with this first launch in December, what we've accomplished. That little tiny guy in May 2010 was a pad abort test, like uh, Peter's mentioning doing uh, year after next in CST-100. Out in the desert again, we like the desert because there's no, not many people around the desert if something goes wrong. Um, we did the abort test and uh, successfully pulled the crew cabin away and did all of the control maneuvers to uh, orient the spacecraft, move it away from any hazard, and then also test all of the nominal reentry systems that we use coming in from uh, from low Earth orbit, from from uh, low Earth orbit or deep space orbit. Then, um, in the future stages, we'll fly on the space launch system, and the the target dates for those are really uh, planned by congressional funding. 
And, and what you'll probably guess is with the tremendous success that we had in December, we're trying to work with those entities and determine how much funding we could really afford and be able to move both those dates up earlier. And working with Boeing and uh, Aerojet and ATK on the uh, Space Launch System, how that whole collaboration will work together. One other thing I'd like to say about the objective of the flight was not only what we did with Orion, but also the Space Launch System, because the cryogenic second stage is virtually identical for the first SLS flight, so we were able to get confidence in that stage on this flight. The ground operations, and you'll see a picture of part of that, we're launching off of 37 at uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, and SLS will fly off of 39. So they actually sound fairly close, and they are, so the former uh, shuttle pads are very close. We'll be able to use the same ground operations, people, procedures, and, and equipment to check out the vehicle on the December flight as we will in the future, again, gaining a lot of confidence. And the um, mission directors that are in uh, Florida actually flew this flight in December. We had 600 commands that were validated that they could command the spacecraft. So you can imagine this was a pretty interesting situation. We had an Air Force, we had a NASA spacecraft on the front of an Air Force booster, and both of these organizations could command that vehicle. With our control systems on the front, we could actually fly the Delta IV around the sky, uh, intentionally or otherwise. So we had a lot of collaboration and coordination with all the entities to work together. So that was another significant aspect of the mission, to get all these different groups of people to pool together and uh, maximize all the resources, and it was tremendously successful. We're very proud of that. And it'll lead to, I think, a very um, economical and successful uh, SLS launch, and then being able to get into, into planetary exploration. So it's a tremendous first step. Next chart. So now a series of slides. Um, what I'll do is show you the assembly of the vehicle, and then Olivia, because she worked on the testing of the program, will talk to you in Spanish about a little of the testing program that we went through uh, to, to qualify the vehicle. What was really fun about this again is that it, it, this is the spacecraft that's gonna go to Mars eventually. It will be refined, we'll take, we're taking weight out of the vehicle, we're optimizing the heat shield performance, having all the data from the, from the flight. But this, this vehicle that flew in December is the, is the parent of all of the vehicles that'll be flying. So this is one of the first pieces of structure it is uh, isogrid, like a lot of high-efficiency uh, high structures are today. Um, but what is unique a little bit about us is that it's all welded together. It's very complicated to build a vehicle, you can imagine, 17 feet in diameter, 5 meters, that's welded with these curved panels of complex shapes. But it saved us the risk of leaks, so that we wouldn't have to carry extra gases with us during long missions for a long duration capability. Now, the vehicle, I, I hope you can sympathize with us about how complex this is. The pressure structure is the backbone that carries everything. All of the rest of the systems are attached to it. So you can see a lot of mounting points, lugs that we call them, that things are reinforced for various components that will be um, attached to the rest of the vehicle. You can see the conical shape here and what's pressurized on the inside and what will be unpressurized on the outside of the cone and the docking hatch on the front where all the parachutes and navigation systems are that need to be on that end of the vehicle. This is in New Orleans at the Michoud, uh, the Michoud Assembly Facility. This photograph is in the Operations and Checkout Building at, at Kennedy Space Center, a NASA building that, uh, like Spaceport Florida, that refurbished the uh, orbiter processing facilities for Boeing for CST-100. This California company, Spaceport Florida, helped refurbish this building. So, it's been interesting because this has a lot of heritage. The Apollo missions were processed in this building. Um, and so it's been a lot of fun to upgrade it to 40 years later and using all the, the same capability that was developed so long ago. And a lot of the benefits, you look back, the engineers, one of our, our chief engineer actually had on his board on the wall, um, when we run into trouble, it said, uh, how would Apollo have done it? There are a lot of things hidden in the documentation that Apollo solved a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve today and leveraging off of that experience. So this is what we call a birdcage fixture where all the components are uh, installed and aligned properly on the vehicle. This is our heat shield. I like this chart because usually in government shots there are two people working and eight or ten people watching. 
This one we've got uh, sort of like commercial launch uh, contract acquisition approaches. We've got about eight people working and two watching, but I'm not really quite sure this fellow on the left with his hand on his head is doing. He's, he seems to be very concerned about something. But the heat shield, we had this fun competition going on inside Lockheed Martin because uh, a Mars program, Mars Science Lab, that launched about a year ago and, and landed at Mars about six months ago, um, it was the largest heat shield ever produced. This is just about half a meter, a little less than half a meter bigger. So we were just behind them in this manufacturing process. So we hold the record as the world's largest heat shield that's ever been produced. Uh, it, it, uh, it also owes a lot of heritage to, uh, to Apollo. Uh, there's a, a significant advantage to using a spacecraft of this type of design that has almost full-scale flight data. So the Apollo programs, I keep forgetting, but I think about 12 uh, high-speed entries with the, the heat shield. We could learn a lot about the design of it, which saved a lot of time and money in developing the vehicle. And again, in those trades, that's why we are a capsule rather than this really sexy wing vehicle body we started with early in the program. So the heat shield's very intriguing. You can tell by all the little colored pieces of tape on there. Some of those are manufacturing repairs. Some of that, a lot of that is instrumentation. A lot of energy measurement and temperature measurement because at our, we're coming in at 20,000 miles an hour. Um, a shuttle return is 17, so we're higher than that. It's 84% it's of what a return from the moon would be. So very close to actual real life conditions. And with all the modeling that was done ahead of time and the instrumentation layout of the vehicle, the engineers are having a wonderful enough time now going back and correlating all of their models and being able to upgrade them to the higher velocities that will come back from the moon or Mars. Next slide. So this is the vehicle with the heat shield attached. There were significant challenges to get all of the instrumentation on board the vehicle. We've got over a thousand channels of strain gauges, accelerometers, calorimeters, and, and such. But they all had to fit in the wire harnesses and the data acquisition units and the recorders in the vehicle that will hopefully not carry them in the future during operational missions. So it was a great trick to try to get all of this installed in the vehicle and then the, the heat shield attached behind it for, for its first flight. But you can see a little bit of the, uh, of the structure, like the pressurized structure inside the spacecraft underneath the the um, electronics and propulsion systems that are on board. The vehicle has four propulsion systems, unfortunately, um, due to the architecture of the design. We need a large, en a large engine to do efficient interplanetary returns. That's down on this part of the vehicle, a service module. Reaction control system, which is higher thrust so that it can do the orientation of the full stack. Um, and then we have backup engines, so if that large engine were to fail, we have a completely separate design system that would that could be used to return the astronauts from deep spaces, deep places. But then we also need a reaction control system, and I'll show you it in, in operation when we came in during the first flight. That's really amazing photography from our flight. So you can kind of, you can see on these pictures on the edges the fairings. Those are about a thousand pounds a piece, and they take the loads during launch. And you can sort of tell in this picture how flimsy and lightweight the rest of the service structure is. Again, saving that efficiency for the interplanetary flights. Next chart. And we're and again you can we're pretty proud of this room. It was all it was basically a warehouse, dirty, dingy, dark. Um, walls were all painted. There's a basement, so all the commodities come in through the basement, pressurized gases, electrical power and such. So all can keep the the um, factory floor very clean. Um, in hopes of being able to process more spacecraft than just Orion in this facility as well. But the reason we do that is so that we can share the crews and keep their proficiency up on, on infrequent launch missions, again, to be affordable. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to, uh, to Olivia to talk about the, the electrical functional testing that we've done. Buenos días a todos. Gracias por venir. Gracias por tenernos aquí. Para compartir nuestras experiencias. Eh, en Orión. Eh, yo, mi nombre es Olivia Fuentes, soy una ingeniera aeroespacial y he contribuido en varias eh, facciones del programa, comenzando con los requisitos, eh, la integración del vehículo y las pruebas que hemos tenido que hacer antes de poder lanzar el vehículo en diciembre, que fue maravilloso ver tanto esfuerzo y tanto trabajo 
poder lanzar el vehículo y verlo, hacer todas las cosas que nosotros diseñamos, pero eso vino con todo el esfuerzo, comenzando con los requisitos, que fue lo que nosotros pudimos aprobar, poder probar durante estas pruebas en, en este edificio, que antes fue usado para, por Apolo. Y aquí lo que estás viendo en esta foto es cuando pusimos el vehículo. ¿Más? En, en este vehículo usted puede ver que es a donde pudimos entregar el, el vehículo de la tripulación arriba del módulo de servicios donde ahí tenemos eh, las baterías, todos los, los sistemas electrónicos 